Welcome back to our World History um, Lectures. We are going to be talking about the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Era today. Um, you will notice I am using a different PowerPoint than the one that I sent you in your email. That is simply because when I tried to project the email, sorry, the PowerPoint that I sent you through email, the writing was not readable um, in the recordings. So I have simply switched to the BJU Press PowerPoint that goes along with the information in your chapter. The other PowerPoint has the same kind of information, just organized slightly differently. Um, and you are more than welcome to continue to use that other PowerPoint um, as a resource and reference. I do apologize for the change, but you just weren't going to be able to see the writing for the other PowerPoint. The, the words uh, were in too light of a font. Let's begin. We're going to talk about the French destruction of the old regime. Um, and so we're going to talk about social classes in the French regime, the political and economic factors that contributed to the French Revolution, how the French Revolution, how the French Revolution declined into the reign of terror. And we're going to begin with the reasons for discontent. All right. So during most of the 18th century, France was the cultural center of Europe. We've already talked about how when Louis XIV was the king, he was the picture of an absolute monarch. And we've talked about the fact that um, his court was the place everybody wanted to be. Other kings sent their nobility to King Louis XIV's court or to the French court to learn proper courtier behavior um, or courtly behavior. Um, so, France had been the cultural center of Europe. All legal documents were written in French. It was just considered the height of culture at the time. It had an absolutist government, um, which it was imitated by many European monarchs. Uh, court life, art, fashion of France was all the envy of Europe. Other kings tried to be like the king of France. They wanted that... Um, that grandeur and, and that culture. France had one of the largest populations and one of the most active trade economies in the world at the time, but it was all a facade. Um, it was an appearance of prosperity, but there was also a sense of unrest and turmoil that was brooding under there. The French philosophes had promoted ideas of personal rights and liberties, but they didn't enjoy these freedoms, and neither did the other people in France. Uh, they didn't enjoy them because of the absolute rule of the monarch and the domination of the Roman church. So these were problems uh, that France was facing. So what were the reasons for the discontent? Well, there were many factors that contributed to the revolution. Um, none was, no one factor was sufficient enough for a revolt. It's when you put them all together that there is widespread discontent with the old regime. Now, the old regime is the name given to the political and social order of France before the French Revolution. Um, so, what were some of these? Well, there was social inequality, and we're going to take a look at this. Okay. So, the society was still organized according to the feudal class divisions. Even though they weren't still working under feudalism, the class divisions had maintained. Privileges and taxes were determined by class. So the first estate was made up of the clergy and the Roman Catholic Church. That was the highest order. The second estate was made up mainly of the nobility. These two estates made up the top levels of society. Um, the third estate was the largest class, had about 98% of the population in it. Um, but of these three estates, this class had the greatest social and economic diversity. Some people made quite a good living, some people didn't make a good living at all, some people were very poor. The third estate was required to pay an annual fee to the noble who owned the land where they lived and worked. Sorry. They also had to pay a fee to the former owner when the land changed hands. They had to pay a fee for the use of the mills, ovens, wine presses, even if they didn't use them. 
they had to perform corvée, which is a system of forced labor. There would be a time when they had to go and work the nobles' land for no money. And they had to respect the nobles' hunting privileges. All of these things um, were, were burdensome on the third estate. Meanwhile, the first estate, the Catholic clergy, um, had great wealth and land. They were tax-exempt. And they used the wealth of the church as though it was their personal wealth. The second estate, the nobility, was privileged. They were also tax-exempt, and they owned over 40% of the land. And they exploited the workers. They took the top positions that paid the most and had others do the work while they collected the money for the, um, for the job. The third estate has 98% of the population, uh, has three groups within that, that population. There's the lawyers, doctors, bankers, wealthy businessmen. The next group is the city and town workers. And then about 80% of the third estate are made up of peasants. They were extremely poor tenants on wealthy estates. They made low wages, had few possessions, and they paid the highest taxes. They were required to adhere to feudal obligations like paying these fees to the landowners. This is a, a graph that shows you, um, uh, it just gives you a, a pictorial example of the population within each of these estates. So political inefficiency is the next reason uh, for the discontent that comes about with the regime. Um, so Louis the Fourteenth had been an absolute ruler. Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth were disinterested in governing. Louis the Fourteenth had his hand on everything. He had control of everything. He was very much involved in governing. But his successors, Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth, were not that interested in governing. They had very little sense of responsibility. They often followed the bad advice of their mistresses. Um, and scheming nobles. They had many groups that sought to gain an advantage um, from these, these two kings. The nobles believed that Louis XIV had, a, had deprived their ancestors of authority, and they wanted to get that back. The middle class wanted political power because of the Enlightenment thinking, and they thought they could get that from the king. The lower class resented the unfair tax burden and economic burden that was put on them. All of these things are going to lead up and, and culminate in um, disgruntlement with the government. Um, the central government, because of this, was incompetent. It was inefficient. Um, many groups wanted to gain additional um, power due to this. Uh, then you have the unbalanced tax system, where the poorest 80% of the people are paying the most taxes, and the richest percentages of people, the clergy and the nobles, are paying no taxes. Um, then you have the virtual bankruptcy of the French government. They're sinking deeper and deeper into debt, um, even though they're heaping these heavy taxes on people. These people aren't making a lot of money. They, they don't have the money to pay the taxes. And, and they continue to wage war and, and live extravagant lives without the proper income coming in. So to reduce the debt, to reduce the debt um, of the French government, the French government puts even more taxes on. They devalue or debase the French currency and they borrow from private banks. And this is all going to lead to a financial crisis in 1787. Um, and that financial crisis is going to uh, pave the way for what we call the French Revolution. Um, the, the government just kept sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. So, how does the revolution begin? Well, there's the calling of the Estates General. Um, France is broke. There's no money in the treasury. They can't get any more money out of taxes. Um, and so the advisors to the king urge him to tax those who paid no taxes. 
which would be the nobles and the clergy. Now, this is going to be very unpopular with the nobles and the clergy, who tend to have the most money and the most power right now besides the king. The nobles insist that only the estates general can change taxes, and the estates general hadn't met since 1614. So Louis XVI calls for a meeting of the Estates General in May of 1789. People were to choose their representatives and make a list of grievances, or cahiers. Okay? Um, the cahiers of the Third Estate wanted a written constitution, equal taxation, equal justice, and the destruction of the remnants of the feudal system. The First and Second Estates called for a constitution that would stop the king from taking their rights and privileges. So, the third estate gets disappointed in their treatment. The deputies make their way to Versailles in April of 1789. The king gives each estate one vote. Well, the, the people on the third estate want each delegate's vote to be counted separately, regardless of the estate. The first and second estates weren't interested in third estate's grievances, so the clergy and the nobles weren't interested in 98% of the population's grievances, and they could uh, come together to outvote the third estate if each estate only had one vote. This is a picture or a painting of uh, the opening of the estates general. The third estate's disappointed in their treatment um, they are, think, feel that they are treated significantly inferior to the other two estates, um, and so they, they are really disgruntled with this. So they work to form what's called the National Assembly. The National Assembly. Um, there's disagreement over the voting continues until June 17th. So for over a month, they argue over how many votes each estate's going to get. Is it going to be each delegate? Is it going to be one per estate? How is this going to be determined? So the delegates of the third estate declare themselves a national assembly, and they need an indoor tennis court because the assembly room door is locked. They take what's called the tennis court oath, which is that they won't be disbanded until a constitution is written. Three days later, the king expresses his displeasure, and disbands the estates general. They still have not accomplished what they needed to accomplish, um, which was deal with the massive indebtedness of France. Um, so on the 27th of June, Lord, Louis orders the first and second estates to join the National Assembly, and they call it the National Constituent Assembly. They're getting ready to draw up a constitution, but while they're trying to draw up the constitution, um, Louis plans to close down the assembly. Um, so the king had been appearing to comply. He's waiting on the troops that he's ordered to Versailles and to Paris. And, and, and once they get there, his intention is to use the military troops to close down the assembly. That's not going to work very well for him, though, um, because on July 12th, Paris is going to become a place of rioting and looting. An interesting note here, Thomas Jefferson was actually living in France at the time. He was living near Paris at the time. He was the U.S. ambassador to France, um, and he was living in France at the beginning of the French Revolution um, he, with his daughter, as a matter of fact, he is able to get his daughter and himself and his household out of France and back to the U.S. unharmed. Um, but he actually supported the French Revolution. He said that they had really come and supported us uh, during the U.S. Revolution, and it was there that they had been exposed to a lot of these ideas, a lot of the just um, everyday soldiers that wouldn't have had the chance to go and, and sit in any of the salons in France to hear the discussion of these Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, many of the just day-to-day -day soldiers of the French army that had come and helped the U.S. get exposed to the Enlightenment ideals of freedom um, through serving in the uh, U.S. Uh, Revolutionary War. 
Um, so July 12th, Paris becomes a place of rioting and looting. The nobles are angry because of the high cost of bread and rumors, uh, sorry, the mobs, not the nobles, the mobs, the general public are angry because of the high cost of bread and it's extremely expensive. They can't afford to buy bread for their families and rumors of the troops coming. They gather their weapons, um, but they need more. They feel like they need more. So the government weapons are stored in uh, the uh, Hotel de Envelade, which is the hospital for soldiers, and the Bastille, which is a political prison. It's where the king would put uh, people who were coming up against him. On July 14th, 1789, the mob stormed the hotel, at the hotel and the Bastille. They kill the governor of the prison and his men, and the storming of the Bastille comes to symbolize the beginning of revolution. And to this day, France celebrates July 14th like their Independence Day, um, but it's actually the storming of the Bastille. Um, so this is a picture of the storming of the Bastille. Okay, so there are phases to this revolution. The storming of the Bastille um, causes the uprisings to, uh, to intensify and to begin to occur across the French countryside. Um, the pro most prominent of the Assembly's early actions is the uh, adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And you actually had an assignment to compare and contrast the Declaration of the Rights of Man and our Declaration of Independence. So you should have been able to see similar ideas and, and see the influence of uh, the U.S. Revolution and the U.S. Um, um, Declaration of Independence on the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, so the National Constituent Assembly passed reform legislation that ended the old regime. From 1789 to 1791, there are over 2,000 laws that are passed. August 27th of 1789 is when the Declaration of the Rights of Man um, is passed, and it's derived partly from the English Bill of Rights, partly from the ideas of Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Locke, and partly from the Declaration of Independence. Louis refuses to consent to any of the legislation, um, and so rioting occurs again, and mainly it's because of the cost of food. People cannot afford food to eat or food to feed their families. Uh, there's a food sh shortage. The king refuses this legislation. It just continues to uh, throw fuel on the fire. Um, it, it continues to, to ignite uh, more resistance and more riots. Marchers force the royal family to go to Paris. They have to leave the Palace of Versailles and go to Paris. So the king gives consent to the laws, finally. Um, but the financial crisis worsens because the taxes aren't being collected. They were already in a financial uh, crisis to begin with. The Catholic Church's land is taken, and the church is put under the control of a civilian government. Uh, called the Constitution of the Clergy. This law and oath require, uh, require the clergy, sorry, this law and the oath that it required antagonized the Catholics. The clergy had to, to uh, take an oath to the civil government. Um, that's going to cause the Catholic Church to be very um, upset and distraught. So, um, Move to the next slide here. Uh, the king sees that his power is being taken away. He's uh, scared for his life. He tries to escape from France, but he and the fan his family are captured and taken back to Paris by armed guard. And in September, the National Constituent Assembly completed the Constitution that it had been working on for two years. Now, at this point, you might think, okay, great. They've got a Constitution. Things are going to settle down but that's not going to happen. The French Revolution is going to take a very different form than the American Revolution. And many in America are not going to support the French Revolution because of the violent nature of it in the civilian realm. It is not a military revolution. It becomes um, basically anarchy.
So, October 1791, the Legislative Assembly convenes for the first time, has newly elect elected members, but they have no experience in governing. A uh, few of the Frenchmen actually support the new government. You have a group called the Jacobins, who want the most radical changes. Um, and uh, Jean-Paul Marat, uh, Georges Jacques Danton, and Maximilien de Robespierre, Robespierre are the leaders of the Jacob Jacobins. Um, they often stir up mobs in the cities, especially in Paris, in order to try and achieve their radical goals. Um, so uh, this is um, a picture of Marat um, after he's been assassinated um, and he actually becomes uh, considered a hero of the revolution. This is Robespierre. Robespierre is going to play a very prominent role. Okay, in the middle of all this, there's going to be a war. Uh, not just the civil strife that Fran France is going through, but there is going to be a war with um, Prussia and Austria. So, um, now you don't just have the radicals of the Jacobins. Uh, you have, do have a group of conservatives and a group of moderates as well. The conservatives wanted were satisfied with reforms of the revolution and the constitution. They said, we're, we've done what we came to do, we're, we're good with that, we need to stick with this government. The moderates agreed with the conservatives on some things and the radicals on others. So they were kind of in between the two groups. Um, but the Jacobins, they were the most radical and they believed that the new constitution only favored the middle class, they wanted a greater share of French wealth, wealth for themselves, and more power in the government. Okay, so then we come to the war with Austria and Prussia. April uh, 1792, the Legislative Assembly is uh, backed by the king, uh, declares war on Austria. From this point until the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, there is constant war in Europe. So from 1792 until 1815, Europe is in a constant state of war. That kind of explains why uh, George Washington and many in the United States developed an isolationist attitude um, about foreign policy. They said Europe is always at war. We, we cannot get into that. We can't take sides. We're going to be isolationist and neutral. Um, so why is Europe at war for so long? Well, the king had hoped that Austria would defeat the assembly and then return him to power. So he supported going to war with Austria because he thought that Austria would actually defeat the assembly and allow the king to come back to power. The assembly had hoped that the defeat of Austria would gain the people's support for their government. The Jacobins hadn't wanted war. They said that a French victory would ruin their chance of gaining power. Morat and Danton actually sabotaged the war effort by delaying requests for supplies. And in July of 1798, Prussia joined with Austria and invaded France. Um, so, there's going to be, uh, the Duke is going to issue in July 1792 the Brunswick Manifesto, which is calling on the French people to get behind their king and protect him from the leaders of the revolution. This is the Duke of, of Brunswick. Uh, this, is, this is the Prussian Duke of Prun Brunswick. This is not a French Duke. But he's going to appeal to the French people and say, you know, you really need to get behind your king. You need to get him back in power um, and, and get rid of these, this lead, these leaders of the revolution. Um, and the Duke of Brunswick actually promised to restore the king to power when Paris was captured. Um, unfortunately, that for the king, that's not going to happen. Um, and so... Uh, the Brunswick Manifesto is actually going to cause the people, coupled with the military defeats that, that they um, experience, the people are going to distrust the king. And on August 10th, 1792, a mob led by Danton, remember he was one of the lead Jacobins, um, invades the palace and murders the guards. The assembly actually protects the king until the mob demands a new convention to write a new constitution. And it forces them to call for elections to the new body, called the National Convention. 
Danton becomes the virtual dictator of France during the, the interim time. Um, and murders and massacres of people suspected of working against the revolution are his uh, modus operandi, which it's, it's his mode of operation. He just, he searches out people that he thinks um, are working against the revolution and he has them murdered or massacred. September 22nd, uh, 1792, the new national convention abolishes the monarchy and uh, says that 1792 is year one of the French Republic. They tried Louis XVI for treason, they found him guilty, and on January 21st, 1793, um, he is beheaded by the guillotine. Sorry, I think I got ahead of myself. Yes, he is beheaded by the guillotine. And the reign of terror begins. Okay. Um, so the Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety is 12 men who are appointed to take over the everyday government affairs. They are supposed to deal with the everyday running of the governments. 12 men. Robespierre is the leader, and he creates the new orders in France. He orders the suppression of opposition to the revolution. So anybody who is against the revolution is, is to be suppressed. Um, he creates a new order in France. 20 to 40,000 people are executed during this time, and most of them are peasants. The 20 to 40,000 people are executed, mainly beheaded during this time. The revolution motto was liberty, equality, and fraternity, but it was meaningless. The committee gets entire citizenry involved in the war, in the war effort. It's called the lave en masse. The lave en masse. And It says that everybody, it has to be involved in the war effort. The European coalition is a temporary alliance that tried to keep the revolution from spreading to other nations. There was a real concern in other European nations that this hysteria, this, this revolution would spread to other nations and, and they needed to try and, and deal with that. Now the citizen army, the lave en masse, uh, was um, actually successful in several battles. It, it ran a series of victories over this European uh, coalition. Um, France wins several victories, and this helps to relieve some tensions in Paris. Um, and Dante, I'm uh, sorry, Danton actually calls for an end to the reign of terror. Um, now, remember, he had started out by uh, hunting down and murdering or massacring people who opposed him. But now he is calling for an end to the reign of terror. He says that time is over. It, it's time to, to return to a, a time of peace and normalcy. Robespierre, however, is not quite ready for that. He has Danton um, arrested, tried, and executed. He declares that traitors are still among them and must be rooted out. No one is safe. Uh, this scares the convention, and they have Robespierre arrested, um, and he is also executed. Uh, he and his followers are executed. This does end the reign of terror. This is a British political cartoon from 1798. It shows the French Revolution as a devouring monster that has uh, ravaged the continent and is attempting to take Britain as well. So it's warning against uh, this revolution. Okay, so the end of the National Convention. 1795, a new constitution is enacted, brings an end to the convention and establishes what they call the Directory. Now the Directory inherits a lot of the same problems that the convention had had. And it places its hopes in the defense of France of the defense of France in the hands of Napoleon Bonaparte. And that, we're going to talk about the Napoleonic era in just a moment. 
Um, you need to understand, and, and this is a very quick overview of the French Revolution, uh, but you need to understand that uh, they went through almost a new constitution in government a year. They averaged about a year. And I think it was something like seven or eight constitutions and governments that, that they went through during this time of French of the French Revolution. It was a very chaotic, very bloody time. Um, Charles Dickens wrote a novel uh, based during the time. It's called A Tale of Two Cities. Um, it's it's a, a horrendous time in French history. And uh, there was a real fear that it would spread throughout Europe. But it was heavily influenced and motivated by the ideas that the everyday French soldier was exposed to um, in coming and fighting the American Revolution and in the ideas that many of the more upper class, middle and upper class, even within the third estate, the middle and upper class of, of that estate would have been exposed to through the Enlightenment philosophs, Enlightenment thinkers uh, in the salons of, of France. Let's move on to the Napoleonic era. These are your section reviews. I'm gonna get through those really quickly. We'll cover those in a Skype session. So the Napoleonic era, we need to determine how Napoleon rose to power, what reforms he put in place, and what led to his downfall. So, the Napoleonic era is the period of history from 1796 to 1815. Um, Napoleon himself lived from 1769 to 1821. He was actually born in Corsica, it's an island. Um, he attended a military academy and studied military strategy, and he served in the French Revolution, so he was no stranger to that chaotic time. He actually helped suppress a, a riot in Paris in 1795, which gained him some, um, some fame and, and some acclaim within the government, and he led the French forces against Austria um, during that time. He actually used new rules during his... Um, during his fighting, um, he marched at night, he fought on Sundays, and he fought in the rain. And these were things that other European nations tended to not do. This gave him uh, quite a bit of victories. Uh, he, uh, so that made him very popular, very famous uh, in France. But uh, in 1797, Austria and France make peace. And Napoleon is coming back to Paris as a hero. The members of the directory are jealous and fearful of Napoleon's popularity. Um, so they're, they're not really sure about having him in Paris. So they figure the best thing to do is getting back out there again. And, you know, France and Britain have been fighting for a long time. And so uh, what better place uh, to send him than to attack Britain? Well, Napoleon is too smart for that. He realizes that attacking Britain is not the best course of action, but he can attack Egypt and cut off Britain's Near East trade, and that would have a massive effect on Britain. Um, and so that's what he does. He heads to Egypt, and at first he has some uh, really good victories early on, but the British fleet, um, the British Navy is not to be messed with, and the British fleet very easily destroys the French fleet in Egypt. They manage to blockade Napoleon in Egypt, um, and Napoleon finds out that the European coalition is getting ready to renew war on France. Um, that bothers him, scares him. Uh, he's, he wants to protect France, and so he heads back to Paris. And he gets back to Paris before anybody finds out about the defeats in Egypt um, and is able to stage a successful coup d'etat. Um, so this is a portrait of Napoleon in Egypt. Okay, so once Napoleon's in Paris, he is able to stage a coup d'etat, which is a sudden illegal seizure of power. Um, and in 1799, he forms a new government called the Consulate. Um, it's a three-man government, three-man consulate, but most of the power is concentrated in the first consul, and the first consul is Napoleon. Um, Peace treaties are signed with Austria in 1800 and Britain in 1802. That was his first um, priority was to get peace with these, um, these adversaries. Um, 
And so he's able to negotiate and sign peace treaties with Austria in 1800 and Britain in 1802. And then he starts in on uh, domestic reforms. Um, domestic reforms include things like public works, uh, making sure the bridges and roads and things like that are getting built and dealt with. Uh, he establishes the Bank of France. It helps standardize the French money. He creates an equitable tax system, which helps stabilize the national debt. Creates a system of public education so that the citizens, the children, have access to education. But probably the most famous is his Code Napoleon. Code Napoleon is the codified laws. They're the civil, criminal, and commercial laws that were already there, kind of being um, adhered to, but he puts them in a code. Uh, it, puts them, it makes them uh, official. Sorry. There we go. Um, now, most French had continued to be loyal Catholics, um, even throughout the Revolution. And um, Napoleon realizes that he can increase his influence and popularity with the people and the government if he restores some of the Catholic privileges. And so he comes to an accord with the Pope, into an accord with the Pope, and in that accord, he gives back some of the church land. He says that seminaries can reopen. He says that church services can be held out in open, the open again instead of secretively. But that the state would nominate the bishops and the state would pay the clergy. So the state would maintain some control over the church. Um, while he did this, um, and, and this was considered um, to be a, a great thing by many of the nation's Catholics, um, he still was undermining the accord with other laws. So this was done more to gain him popularity and influence than it was to really give the, the church back anything it had lost during the Revolution. Um, so in 1802, the people actually vote to make Napoleon the first consul for life. And, and you'll remember, if you notice, this is a little bit... Um, reminiscent of what happens with Julius Caesar in, in Rome. Um, and so Napoleon becomes the first consulate for life um, in 1802 with, because of the will of the people. In 1804, the Senate actually makes Napoleon emperor of France, and the French Republic is officially over. He actually takes the crown and puts it on his own head. Um, Napoleon isn't satisfied, though. He desires to be the master of Europe. And so he sets out to uh, become a man of conquest. Um, he can't succeed in this, though, until he deals with Britain. Britain is a formidable force. France has not been able to defeat or uh, neutralize Britain um, in, the many, in its many attempts. And so he's got to figure out how to deal with that. And he has an invasion plan. But that, that gets thwarted because of the strength of the British Navy. That, that's not going to happen. Remember, Britain is actually an island. And so uh, he's not going to be able to invade Britain without going through the Navy. So he changes tactics. And he decides to attack the British allies. And he attacks the British allies on the continent um, in order to um, disrupt Britain's economy. Um, and so what he does, uh, he has some success in 1805 at uh, Austerlitz uh, over Russia and Austria. And the idea is that um, if he deal, gets uh, control or defeats enough of Britain's allies, he can shut down economic trade, which will bring Britain to its knees. 1806, um, he's able to dissolve the Holy Roman Empire and sets up the Confederation of the Rhine. So he's now in control of that as well. But he still has a problem. Britain still controls the seas. Um, he's mastered most of mainland Europe, but he cannot get a hold of Britain because it still controls the seas. So he comes up with what's called the Continental System, which will close Europe's ports to British trade. Um, and that should cause an economic collapse of Great Britain. Most Europeans saw Napoleon as a liberator when he first got there, um, helping to liberate them from their absolutist monarchs. Um, but that's not going to continue. Um, this is the French general with outstretched arms, uh, presents the standards of the enemy to Napoleon at Austerlitz. So this is, uh, this is um, 
just a painting of his victory there. Okay. He's at first seen as a liberator when he comes into these European nations, but that is not going to, to remain. Um, be, partly because he replaces a lot of the rulers with his own relatives uh, because he wants to maintain control. He demands that each nation supply him with soldiers and supplies for their soldiers. He stole a lot of the national treasures um, and took them back to Paris for himself. And he had very little concern for the national feelings or interests of the nation. Um, so this is going to stir up what's called nationalistic pride. Um, and, and it's going to go against French, uh, Napoleon and French domination. And one of the first places that we see the people um, seeking freedom from this French domination and resisting the continental system is on the Iberian Peninsula, both Portugal and Spain. Um, Portugal is going to violate the blockade against Britain, and Spain is going to revolt against Napoleon's brother, whom Napoleon had put on, on the throne of Spain. They're going to use guerrilla warfare, so they're not going to have major victories, but they're going to continue to be a problem for Napoleon. Um, even when the French troops are sent in to help crush these uprisings, they're not going to be majorly successful because of this guerrilla warfare. And then Britain is actually going to land in Portugal and be able to drive the French out. The next area that is going to resist Napoleon is Russia. Russia in 1810, Tsar Alexander I has continued trade with Britain. Um, so Napoleon forms the Grand Army, which is um, over 600,000 people. Um, and in 1812, he invades Russia. Now Napoleon wants one decisive battle, but Russia knows it's outnumbered and that it's not gonna win one battle. And so what it does is it constantly draws the French army farther and farther into Russia by retreating. And as they retreat, they scorch the earth, which means they are burning anything that might be of value. They're leaving nothing behind um, for Napoleon's men to use. Now remember, Russia is retreating farther and farther back into its own nation, so its supply lines are getting shorter and shorter, but Napoleon's supply lines are getting longer and longer. And now they can't live off the land because the land has been scorched. Um, so, um, as the Russians retreated, they used the scorched earth policy. In September of 1812, Napoleon does reach Moscow, and he thinks once he reaches, reaches Moscow that he'll force Tsar Alexander I to surrender. Um, but Alexander I isn't in Moscow. Moscow is abandoned. Um, Napoleon shows up and there's nobody there. And then the night that he shows up, all of Moscow burns. So there's nothing there for him and his troops to use. He waits there for about a month, thinking that he's going to force the Tsar into some sort of peace. Um, but it's getting late, and he knows that his army is not suited, it's not geared up for a Russian winter. So he decides he better start heading back to Paris. Already too late, though. Um, winter starts setting in early in Russia, and um, the army is woefully outfitted. Um, they don't have the kind of uniforms they need. They don't have the supplies that they need. The Russian land has been scorched. It's not going to provide what they need. Uh, Russian soldiers are picking off stragglers or, or uh, uh, French soldiers here and there as they try and repeat, uh, retreat. Bridges are being destroyed, so uh, that delays the retreat even more because uh, a new bridge has to be built for the army to get across. And um, it, it's eventually going to uh, become apparent to Napoleon that they're not getting back. Um, if he goes with the army, he's not going to get back to Paris. And so he actually abandons his army and, and runs for Paris, um, trying to make sure he keeps control of the government before they find out about this massive defeat. Only about 100,000 of the 600,000 soldiers that Napoleon took into Russia actually come back out of Russia. And uh, this is um, a map that shows you his um, invasion in and his retreat out. <clears throat> now this isn't the end of Napoleon. In 1813, he's um, engaged in battle again. Um, 
he's he's persuaded the French people to raise an army and go up against the new coalition of European powers. Um, and, and there's a long campaign that happens, but the, the, the culmination of it is in 1813 at, at Leip Leipzig, Germany. It's called the Battle of Nations, and Napoleon's forces are defeated by the coalition of Europe. Um, Napoleon is forced to abdicate. He's exiled to the Isle of Elba. Um, and the Congress of Vienna, the, the, the European coalition, meet in February 1815 at the Congress of Vienna to try and restore some sort of order to Europe. Napoleon has been running rampant, the French Revolution, and then Napoleon was running rampant, and some sort of orders got to come back to the continent of Europe. And so they hold the Congress of Vienna. While they're meeting, however, um, they find out that Napoleon has escaped. He's escaped the Isle of Elba. He's made it back to Paris. He's raised an army yet again. And um, on June 8th, 1815, his army is going to clash with the European coalition's army again uh, at, at Waterloo. It's in modern-day Belgium. And the British Duke of Wellington is going to win a decisive victory over Napoleon. Um, this time, Napoleon is going to be banished to St. Helena, which is a little island in the middle of the South Atlantic. He's going to live un uh, under guard for the next six years, um, to, and he's going to die um, on that island on May 5th of 1821. Um, hopefully this has helped you understand um, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. Uh, it has been a very quick um, run through of the major events of these times, but hopefully you were um, able to, to glean a little bit of information from it. I'll see you next time when we talk about the Industrial Revolution.